Today we're going to talk about web components and CSS. And while I was standing over there, I was a little bit curious because kind of, there's like two buzzwords here. And I just am curious about what the audience thinks. And so you can only pick one. If you're more excited to hear about web components in this talk, uh, raise your hand. And if you're more excited to hear about CSS, raise your hand. OK, that was a little bit more even than I was expecting. Um, so I, I've been writing CSS pretty much since I was born. And it's, <laughs> it's been hard. It's been, sometimes it's been, it's been really fun. I mean, it was how I got into web development. And um, when I first heard about web components a couple years ago, kind of a light went on in my head. It was immediately obvious how this was going to make writing CSS so much better. And since I've you know, been following the development of web components, I haven't really heard very many people talking about this. So I kind of figured, you know, I think this is going to be really revolutionary and somebody should say something. So I decided that somebody should be me. So some quick disclaimers about this talk. Um, I have a lot to talk about. And every web components talk I've ever been to has spent half the time explaining what web components is. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about web components. I hope that's OK. If it's not, sorry about that. Um, I also, this talk is not intended to be a, a how-to guide or a tutorial. Um, when I first heard of web components, I said kind of a light went on in my head. And I kind of wanted this talk to be more about some of those things that I was thinking about, just some of the, uh, the ways that I think web components will completely change how we write CSS for the better in the future. So hopefully, you know, you'll, this, this will be a high level. It'll start you thinking about some things. And then you can kind of use some of these concepts and just go play around. And uh, this is definitely kind of a new, uncharted area. And I think a lot of the things that I am going to say could very well be wrong. And we'll find that out in a couple months or, or years. So keep that, you know, keep an open mind. So I want to start off by talking about what makes CSS hard today. And if you ever read anything like Hacker News comments or anything like that, you see kind of the same stuff over and over again. By the way, you should never read Hacker News comments. It's a bad idea. Um, and these are the things that everybody loves to complain about with CSS. Uh, you know, vertical centering, equal height columns, uh, cross-browser inconsistencies. That um, you kind of have to have this encyclopedic knowledge of tricks and hacks to kind of get anything done. And and you know, it should be easier. And people love to complain about all this stuff. But in in reality, that's not really what makes CSS hard. If you if you're just making your own website, that might be something worth complaining about. But if you work at a company that has a lot, like a large engineering team with a lot of developers all working on the same code base and you're building web applications, you kind of know that there are bigger problems with CSS than, than this stuff. Um, you know, as I was saying before, uh, a lot of the other stuff, you can, you can figure that stuff out by just Googling around or memorizing some of the tricks. So I want to talk about more about the real hard problems in CSS. So things like scoping styles. How do, you, how do you write your CSS in a way where you can style the elements you want without accidentally styling elements you don't want? That's kind of one of the hardest problems in CSS. Um, everyone has dealt with uh, specificity issues, where you, somebody writes a selector, somebody else writes a selector, and your styles don't match. You can't figure out why. And then you realize it's because somebody else's selector is more specific than yours. Um, Non-deterministic non -deterministic matching is kind of along the same lines. Um, that can happen because of specificity issues. It can happen because of source order issues. If you're loading your CSS asynchronously, um, which a lot of companies are doing nowadays, uh, that can cause problems because depending upon which file loads first, you might have different issues with that. Uh, depend dependency management. If, if you have some rules that are supposed to look a certain way and depend on other kind of global things like global paragraph spacing, global heading styles, um, how do you, you know, define these dependencies in your code? And how do you deal with that? Um, and then things like removing unused code. Everyone probably bundles all of the CSS into one big style sheet. And, and then you, know, you have an application that lives for a couple of years. And then you know that there's all this code that's no longer being used. And how do you deal with that? It's, just, it's really hard to, especially on a dynamic site. There's some tools that I've seen around there that kind of go through all your pages and tell you what CSS isn't being used. But it doesn't really work with a real application where, where your pages are dynamically generated. So what do all of these things have in common? So I hope you can see that. It's kind of grayed out a little bit. But I say, hint, it's not, it's not these. And on the left, 
So this is the CSS declaration, and on the left, I've highlighted the properties, and on the right, I've highlighted the selector. And CSS is not hard because of the properties and values. Um, like I said, people like to complain about that, but that's not what makes it hard. What makes it hard is the selectors. Your selectors and how well your selectors are written is the biggest, by far the biggest determining factor in how scalable your code will be into the future. Because selectors are effectively global, global variables and it's incredibly hard to write predictable code when any rule that you write could potentially conflict with other rules on the page, rules that may not be there right now, rules that you don't know exist. Um, it can be incredibly infuriating and it's, it all has to do with your selectors. I'll try not to turn this way because you can't hear me. Um, so writing bad selectors will at some point cripple your application development. Every company I've ever worked at uh, has had the, tr you know, the opportunity, the resources to implement some feature and they have chosen not to because they were afraid because of their CSS. And that just seems like the stupidest thing in the world, but it happens all the time. And it has to do with your selectors. So <laughs> what are bad selectors? Uh, really, uh, it really comes down to selectors that kind of cast a wide net, selectors that potentially match a lot of elements are inevitably going to be bad selectors. And I, I wrote this slide at the HTML5 um, Def Comp. Apparently people who write CSS like to live dangerously. And, he, and here's the proof. This is, I want to leave this up here for a second. I want to let it sink in. Uh, this is an actual uh, CSS declaration that I encountered at a previous company I worked at. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna shame them publicly, uh, <laughs> because I own stock in the company. Um, <laughs> so what was going on here was this was a page that was uh, there were there were a lot of pages and the bulk of this this application was forms and the forms were all laid out in two columns and it just so happened that the columns were divs inside of divs inside of divs. And so somebody said, oh, well, I see what's going on here. I can, I can make this work by this one rule. And it will apply to everything in the site. And it's great. And it did work. Uh, but as, as I'm sure all you can realize, as soon as you add any other div anywhere in the page, it's probably going to match this element. You know, what are the chances that a div has two parent divs? You know, zero, right? So you might be thinking, OK, but my selectors aren't that bad. Um, and you're wrong, they are that bad. All selectors are that bad with a couple of you know, very <laughs> rare exceptions. Um, effectively, so we're developers. We, we want to notice patterns in our markup. We want to write selectors that match those patterns. And we all think we're smarter than our markup. We all think that we can come up with a solution. And this time around, it's going to be different. And we're all wrong, always. Because every time, it, if you have an application where the HTML is going to change ever, your selectors, uh, the more complicated they are, the harder it is to control them. And so, so really, the, the kind of the only way around this, um, and a lot, if you, if you follow CSS best practices, almost everyone that writes about CSS best practices tells you that you should use very low specificity selectors and they should be classes and all this stuff. Um, but, you know, adding classes to your HTML also kind of sucks. And without good conventions, that everyone on your team can agree to, that you can kind of enforce through you know, linting tools and things like that. It's really hard to do this. Um, so this is an example from the uh, Bootstrap uh, docs page. And this is, so this is good because there's a lot of classes here and you, know, you have low specificity selectors. But and again, I want to just leave this up here for a second. I want to kind of talk through this. Because you have a navigation element that has the class navbar and the navbar default, which so far I'm, I'm, I'm on board here. You have a base class and you have a modifier class. And then inside of that, you have a, a wrapper element. You know, you can tell that because it says container. And I don't know what fluid means, but I assume it's, it's doing something here. And then inside of that, you have another wrapper element, which if I'm just looking at this code, and I'm, I myself am not a Bootstrap user, I don't know exactly why this is needed, but Bootstrap is very widely used. It's well tested. I assume this was thought through. And this is, you know, collapse and then navbar collapse. And then inside of that, you have a UL with the class nav and then navbar nav. And I don't, again, I don't know what that is. I don't know why those are there. 
Uh, and I'm not trying to dis bootstrap here. Uh, my point here is that you just kind of have to make this trade off. You have to decide between one or the other. And, and I'll talk about this later, but effectively, I consider this to be implementation details. It kind of sucks that if you want to use Bootstrap, you have to copy this, and you have to make sure that you write all your classes exactly like this, and if you don't, it's not going to work. And it kind of sucks that that's the way it is. Not really. How about Angular directives over the component you mentioned? So in that case, you're doing something dynamically. Uh, you know, you're not, and that's a form of abstraction, which is good. And that will kind of relate to what I'm going to talk about. Um, so what is the answer, and, and what is good CSS? look like. So I kind of wrote this up earlier today. Uh, good, and I'll just read it, good CSS consists of selectors that match exactly the elements you want them to match without accidentally matching the elements that you don't, all while not being overly verbose or repetitive, being resilient to change, and being adaptable to any and all future design requirements. In other words, writing good CSS means you need magical powers and the ability to predict the future. <laughs> So all hope is lost, right? There's just nothing you can do. It's impossible to write good CSS. And so I'm kind of joking, obviously, but um, in my experience, you know, the people, and as, as I kind of mentioned, the people that write good CSS recognize the shortcomings, recognize the limitations, and, and don't try to outsmart the problem. They just deal with it and, and kind of accept it. And, and I'm a huge fan of methodologies like BEM and SMAX and OOCSS. If you're not familiar with these, you should look them up if you're writing. Uh, um, CSS on a large team. They're, they're very, all of them are good conventions. Um, but I think the real question, kind of moving forward, and since this talk is about the future, uh, the real question is, shouldn't be how do I write good CSS? Because we know that the platform is, is limited. The question is, how can we change CSS? How can we change the platform to make it easier, to make, to make it harder to screw up? So what is missing in CSS? If you'd asked me this question uh, a couple years ago, um, I probably, I've, I've kind of cheated because I have the benefit of hindsight. I probably would have come up with this first one. Um, what's desperately missing is the ability to scope styles to a particular section of the DOM or to a particular component. Because right now in CSS, everything is global. And um, a second thing that's missing, and I showed this with the Bootstrap example, is the ability to hide implementation details. Uh, it would be great if, if you could just wrap this up into a little package and give it to somebody. But right now, you can't really. Uh, with, with just kind of HTML and CSS. Uh, and the great thing is, as it turns out, web components give us both of these. So kind of for the rest of this talk, um, I'm going to talk about, about web components and, and give some examples of, of, of how these things are embodied. And specifically, I want to talk about Shadow DOM, because there are a lot of great things about web components, but Shadow DOM really is, is the main thing that benefits CSS. And, and Shadow DOM gives us actual real style encapsulation, two-way style encapsulation. So, we can add elements to the page that, that won't be affected by the existing CSS rules. And we can add CSS rules, style tags, to a subset, to like a subtree. And those styles won't affect the elements that are already on the page. Um, Shadow DOM also allows us to, to, um, to hide these presentational elements. Uh, and you can effectively think of it as a public and a private API. Uh, your shadow nodes are your private nodes, and your public nodes are your, your main DOM nodes. So I kind of just mentioned this. Uh, Shadow DOM is a subtree of DOM nodes that you can create on any HTML element. And the, the Shadow DOM subtree gets combined with the main DOM tree. Um, but unlike the main DOM nodes that, that we're used to, the Shadow nodes can only be modified from within in the same way that if you're writing a class with private methods, only the internals can call those things. So it's, it's kind of very conceptually similar to that. Uh, yeah, Shadow nodes are private. So, so here's an example, a real kind of basic example. Uh, what you have on the right is what you would see in your document source. There's a My Button element, and then the text is Click Me. And on the left is um, the, the HTML text of the Shadow DOM. And you have a style node that has one rule in it to style buttons. And then if you look down, you see that there's a button element, and then there's this content tag. So if you're unfamiliar with um, what content tag is in web components, I mentioned that, you, that your shadow DOM and your main DOM kind of merge together to form the final render tree. And the way that happens is through these content elements. They're called insertion points, and that's how you determine what from your main DOM goes into the shadow DOM and where. And so in this case, so this is actually a web component here, live example. 
um, the click me text is, is all of the children of this button, and that's going to render inside of this content element. And, and so one thing to notice here uh, is this is a regular button on the page, and I've added some CSS that styles this regular button, and it's using a button element. And as you can see from the, from the click me uh, Shadow DOM example, it's also using a button element. And this is actually being rendered on the page. It's not a screenshot. None of the styles from that I have here that I'll kind of select, none of these button styles are affecting the main button and vice versa. None of the, none of the regular full page CSS styles are affecting the, um, the Shadow DOM button. So how do you make Shadow DOM in, uh, in JavaScript? Um, I think there's this kind of misconception that you can only use Shadow DOM with custom elements. It's actually not true. You can use Shadow DOM with any element. And all you do is you grab an element somehow, you know, get a reference to it. In this case, I'm using get element by ID. And then you just call the method create shadow root. And that creates a shadow DOM. And uh, why don't I just go ahead and, and do that while I'm at it here, just to kind of prove that this works this way. So here's my element. How do I get me some shadow DOM? And I have a reference to that, and I just say create shadow root. Let me go ahead and store this on a variable. Now, if you notice what happened, the text just disappeared. And that's because I created a shadow root, and there's no insertion points. So nothing from the main DOM is getting through at this point. So I could say, um, I could say root uh, inner HTML equals uh, foobar. And then now that's what's showing up, because that's, that's the shadow content. But still, that, that line, how do I get me some shadow DOM, that's not showing up anywhere. Um, but I could change that by saying, you know, content, and close the tag, content. Uh, and then as you can see, it's being rendered in between foo and the bar. So that's just one example. I'll go ahead and uh, close this out now. But it really is that easy. You just say create shadow root, and you can do that. You don't have to use it with custom elements, but most of the time, most of the time you will. So uh, I want to talk about some examples. I want to talk about how I think how I predict in the future we will approach styling web pages. And, and we'll do that by creating these basic elements and, and then building sites by composing these elements together. And a very similar way to if you use things like um, OOCSS or BEM, you, you think about styling your web page by recognizing these repeating visual patterns and um, defining them as you know, uh, components in your CSS. And so I think web components is just kind of the natural next progression of those types of, of conventions. So if you follow OOCSS, you've heard of the media object, and I kind of want to use it because it's the poster child example of um, kind of modular CSS. A media object, if you're unfamiliar, is effectively just an image on the left and some content on the right, where the content doesn't kind of wrap below the image as it would with normal floats. And Back in the day, it was much harder to make the CSS to do that. Today, it's much easier with things like Flexbox. But I think it provides a good example. So if you're using some kind of BEM uh, convention syntax, it might look something like this, where you have your container, your media container, and then you have a media, media figure and a media body. And um, the figure is an image in this case. And then you just have some content inside of that. And I, I write down here, one thing to notice is that this media body element, it doesn't really serve any purpose, but it needs to be there because you need to add, you need to have an element to put a class on to write some CSS to make it separate from the image. Um, you know, so it, it's, this, this is very common. If, if you make websites, you, you write container elements all the time. And they just need to be there because you need a hook for the CSS. So it doesn't have to be that way, though, because uh, on the left, I have an example of, of how kind of it should be, how you would think about it. From just a purely kind of semantic perspective, you have your media object, and then you have your content inside of it. And, and you shouldn't have to worry about uh, the presentational elements. You should just have the content, and then that should be taken care of somewhere else. And so this example here uses, um, on, the, on the right, you see the Shadow DOM. Uh, don't pay too much attention to the, the CSS rules. Uh, but this is just what is actually needed when I, when I go to the next slide to, to style them. Um, if you're looking at this host one, host, is a, host just refers to the kind of the host of the whatever element you've created the Shadow DOM on. And, and that's particularly useful. Uh, like I could have just said media object, but in, in this case, uh, you say host in case you ever extend an element and you have a different element name. Kind of host will apply always to whatever the container is. Uh, 
But the main thing to look at is, is this con these two content tags. You have a select attribute that you can apply to a content tag, and you can put an image, or, or well, you can, you can put a, a simple CSS selector in there, and that will say, from my main DOM, in this case, the h1, the image, and the p tag, these elements should go inside this content tag. And anything that's not in that simple selector kind of doesn't go through. And in this case, I have a catch-all with my second content tag. But, but if I didn't have that, you, know, you would only see the image. And in this case, because I have two, you see the, every, everything else. Um, so this is what the composed tree looks like. Again, I don't know if you, can you guys see the grayed out part? Is it, is it OK? OK. So everything that's grayed out is, is shadow DOM, and everything that's not grayed out is main DOM. And this, this figure shows how these things come together. So in this case, you have the image that's inside of that figure, which was an element in the shadow DOM, and you have the H1 and the P inside of that div, which was also in the shadow DOM. So if you look at this example, so as you can see, like, the text doesn't wrap below. And if we look at, I'll go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. If we inspect this, we see the three elements here, and then we see the shadow root if we're looking in the developer tools. Oops. And, and you can open up and you can, and you can see the, um, the shadow uh, DOM elements as well if you've, turned this, if you've enabled this in your, in your dev tools. One thing that I wish the dev tools did is it gave you the view that I was showing over here where you can kind of see the compose tree. It, it doesn't do that right now. Maybe it will in the future. Um, I would like to see that somehow to get kind of a, a, a picture of how this works overall because when you make your when you write your CSS rules, things like first child and you know, child selectors, these actually apply to how the final compose render tree works. So it's often useful to, to see how that all fits together. Uh, but you might be thinking, I don't really like the way that media element looks, or at least it's, it's too plain by itself. I want, to, I want to make it better. I want to make it look nicer. And the great thing about web components is you can compose them inside of other web components to build more complicated components. So in this case, I'm creating an author card, which is just think of it like a business card or something. And this custom element imports the media object. Um, and so this is, goes back to the dependency management issue. Your elements de declare the dependencies themselves. And so up here, I'm, I'm linking to the uh, media object custom element. And then this template is going to serve as my shadow DOM. And I've hidden the styles here because there's kind of too many to show on this one <laughs> slide. But the styles here basically um, style everything in the shadow DOM. And I can even override the styles of the media object here. And that works because it's all scoped inside. And then I'm adding some additional kind of presentational elements to get my author card to look the way I want it to. And so here's my, here's my author card. And it's effectively the media object with just a couple more elements added, some more CSS rules added. Uh, but again, if, if you look at the. Um, if you look at the, the source, you don't see the media object in here in the main source. And so if I'm creating this author card, and if you think of this just like Bootstrap, and, and I say, oh, I, I've got this kind of alert or this nav bar or whatever, uh, you, can, you can abstract all of these implementation details away. You can hide them inside. All the person has to know is, OK, I have a header, and then I have an image somewhere, and then I have a paragraph, and that's all I really need to care about. And then it will look like this. And this is a great relationship between you know, developers and de designers because because there's, there's not a lot of these, again, to use the same word over and over again, not a lot of these implementation details that they have to worry about. Um, layout is a big issue in CSS. Uh, a lot of people kind of don't, aren't very good at, at, at making things work with CSS layout-wise. Um, so it would be great if we had these layout elements that kind of did all of this stuff for us. A lot of people don't like layout elements because they don't want to mix their, their presentational elements, you know, their, their presentation with their, with their markup. Um, you know, and, and, and I'll kind of get to that issue here. But first, I want to just talk about these two. I kind of just made these two layout primitives, I call them. So the first one is a, is a flex grid. And flex grid looks like this. And the features of a flex grid is it, it kind of, you have these boxes that, that take up a certain amount of space, and they flex to fill all the space. And if there's too much space, you know, they, or not enough space, they wrap down to the next line. And as I kind of change the width here, you can see that it, does, like it expands and is always full width, but if it's too small, things wrap to the next line. And this is you know, common whenever I, I often have this requirement in sites that I'm working on. Um, and again, there's no, there's no uh, 
I didn't write any CSS here. I just included this flex grid element, and the CSS is packaged inside of it. And similarly, this is flex line element, which is conceptually similar to the flex grid. It's based on Flexbox. And all of its children either are the size they naturally are, or you can apply this flex attribute, which makes them expand to fill all their empty space. And you can um, nest flex items, flex line items inside of flex line items. And you can ultimately or optionally have them be either rows or columns. And so in this case, I have kind of three, uh, uh, three columns inside of this flex line row. And one of them is uh, its own flex line item that has uh, you know, two children inside of that. And so here's uh, a flex line demo. Maybe this is a bigger. And so as you can see, this is kind of like a way of doing site layout. Um, this is several nested flex line elements. The, the main one is, is vertical, um, where it starts out with the header, and then the content area, and then the ads, and then the footer. And then you can see that there are nested flex line elements inside of those. Um, you can look at the source here, too, if you want to see. So this is kind of a, a way of doing um, layout with, with layout element primitives. And, and you don't really, again, you don't have to worry about how these, like the style of these things, because the styles are defined inside of the elements. Uh, it's entirely possible, though, that um, you don't want to include these presentational elements in your actual source. If you're a, if you're a kind of a markup purist, you, you, you want your markup to be a certain way, and you don't like having presentational stuff inside of it. And, and as I've kind of been hinting to, web components solve this problem really elegantly because you put those presentational elements inside of your shadow DOM so that you don't have to see them in your main DOM. So using the flex line element that I just um, showed you, you can build other other layouts, and you can just kind of define them as their own element. So in this case, there's the classic holy grail layout, which if you've been writing CSS for a while, you remember from back in the day. And you can solve this problem easily with flex line elements that you build kind of inside other flex line elements. So hope the top's a little bit cut off, but on the left, this is what you see in your main DOM. This is what you see in your page source. And I'm just saying the body here is a holy grail element. And I have my header, my main content area, my navigation, my aside, which maybe is advertisements and stuff, and then my footer. And you don't necessarily have to worry about how I've used the flex line element here, but the point is you see that in the shadow DOM, I'm using flex line to, to, to build up this layout, and I don't want the people that are writing the template to have to worry about it. And so if you look at the demo, you see this is the holy grail um, layout, and if I view the source for this page, you know, like I showed you before, all you see is, is these elements. You don't have to worry about how they're working the way they are. That's all hidden, abstracted away into the Shadow DOM. Uh, so as everyone who writes CSS knows, sometimes you have to use hacks to get things to work the way you want them to. It's not clearly a perfect language. There are a lot of things that aren't the way you think they should be. And uh, one great example of this, as I was building this, this flex grid layout primitive, I noticed that I was having this problem. And the problem was, was this. As this changes, the way flex wrap works, I don't know if you guys have tried this at home, but uh, the way flex wrap works is, is it treats every line as almost like a separate flex container. And if I have flex on all of these things, then the very last line is always going to fill all the empty space. And that's, that's not what I want. What I want is what you saw before, where as I change this, the last line, or the, yeah, the last line kind of uh, is as all the other lines are. And it turns out this is not really an easy problem to solve. And uh, it took me a while to figure out how to do this. But ultimately what I did, let's see if I can show this here. Oops. View source, flex grid source, uh, view source. So this is what I did here. I just threw a bunch of divs at the bottom. And these divs are doing nothing other than acting like flex grid items that are just there because they need to be to kind of just be these ghost elements that, that fill up the empty space when that space is not needed. Now if you can imagine if you had to use a flex grid like this all over your page, and you just had all of these empty divs just all over your markup. Um, I mean, like people would probably go crazy, and they would they would wonder what these are there for, and somebody would probably see a bunch of empty divs and delete them, you know. But the great thing about Shadow DOM is you can hide this stuff away, and yeah, it's a crazy hack, 
And hopefully, like the flex uh, box spec updates to solve this problem without having to use this hack. But in the meantime, you can kind of put the stuff and you can abstract it away in your shadow DOM and not have to worry about it. So um, there are a lot of questions that people kind of often ask about this stuff. And so I want to kind of address those up front. And then we're definitely going to have a time for questions later. Um, uh, when can I use this stuff, though? Or, or is, is this some like very experimental bleeding edge technology, or can I use it now? Um, the first time I gave this talk, uh, Polymer was, was in beta. And I think as of very recently, it's, well, I think pretty soon it's going to be um, kind of officially declared uh, production ready. Um, and sites like the Polymer Project um, and ChromeStatus.com are Google sites that are built using Polymer, um, which Polymer is a library that, that makes it easier to use web components. Um, and so Chrome right now is the only browser 36 and above that natively supports all of the web component technologies like Shadow DOM, custom elements, the template tag, HTML imports, and all these things. But if you use the web components.js polyfills, you can get uh, pretty much all of these features in all modern browsers, um, IE 10 plus. And uh, it's worth noting, though, that unfortunately, there are some features. Real, actual style scoping in Shadow DOM is not something that can really be polyfilled. It's kind of impossible. Um, I mean, without like some crazy hacks and some crazy, like you would have to, you'd have to kind of agree not to do certain things in order to make it work. And um, it's just something to be aware of. If you in my experimentation, if you, um, if you write most of your CSS in a component-driven manner, this doesn't end up being that much of a problem because all of your styles then become scoped to whatever component they're in. And so there's going to be very few clashes. And so it actually ends up not being that big of a deal. Uh, I was really disappointed when I found out that the, the polyfill didn't, didn't actually solve this problem. But it turns out to not be that big of a deal. Uh, a question people often ask is, is it possible to style elements in the shadow DOM? There's shadow boundary, but is it possible if I really, really want to, to style these elements? And yes, it is possible. There are two selectors, shallow and deep, that allow you to do this. Or sorry, shadow and deep that allow you to do this. It should have been shallow and deep. Why did it do that? Shadow uh, represents the, the shadow root of a particular element. And since elements can be um, nested inside of other elements, sorry, I'm just giving some water. Since elements can be nested inside of other elements, um, the deep, um, I don't know if it's a selector or a combinator or what it is, but it allows you basically to say any level of nested shadow DOMs, this rule will apply to that. So I would actually recommend never using these, to be perfectly honest, uh, if you can help it. I think any time you try to use them, uh, chances are you are just kind of, you haven't quite made it to the mental shift yet of, of the old way and, and the new way. Uh, I think. A good analogy is a lot of programming languages allow you to use private methods, even though like, they're supposed to be private. Um, most people say you shouldn't do this. And I think the same thing applies here. There are situations where maybe you have to, and so it's OK. But in general, you, sh you shouldn't want to do this. They, sh they should be extensible on their own. Aren't these in the spec? They are in the spec. Um, so to quote the open and closed principle of software development, Software entities, classes, modules, functions, web components should be open for extension but closed for modification. And I think if you're writing an element, you should make it sufficiently extensible. You should, you should allow ways through the public API for people to use your element, change the styles, change the colors, change the themes, and then they don't have to use these, um, these uh, sh uh, shadow and deep selectors. Uh, another common question that people ask is, how do I know when to put content in the main DOM versus the shadow DOM? And I don't think it's super clear cut always, and I think there, it's going to be situational. But in general, as I mentioned a couple times, your shadow DOM is your private API, and your main DOM is your public API. And in general, that's, the, the, that's how you should think about it. Um, because your shadow DOM, the styles are scoped, it could be that you really want that scoping, but these are kind of non, you know, they're not presentational elements, they're real elements, but you just want the scoping. So sometimes you might, you might want to blur this line. But in general, I think that's how you should think about it. Also keep in mind that web components, um, in general, you don't want them to be, to contain dynamic content, because in general, you have a web component, 
and you're going to import it. And so it would be great to, to reduce HTTP requests. You would want to kind of get all your web components together, bundle them into one request. And you can't do that if you have dynamic content in your web component. So it's good to keep anything that's um, dynamic content in your main DOM and also think about it, the public private API uh, differentiator. Um, a lot of people ask about accessibility and uh, SEO with web components. And a lot of work has, has been, and a lot of thought has been put into this. And web components are, are meant to be accessible by default because they're just HTML elements. Um, you can use things like ARIA roles and ARIA attributes, just like you could do with any HTML elements today. Um, from an SEO perspective, uh, you know, search engines, they want to be the best they can be, and they want to, if people start, like when, when people started writing Ajax sites, there was maybe a little bit of a, of a lag, but search engines caught up and they, they started indexing that kind of stuff. And I don't think it's going to be any different with, with web components. Um, you know, search engines, uh, especially search engines that could run JavaScript, they can easily see all of this stuff. So that shouldn't be a problem. Um, and as with any new technology, just to be sure, you should test it with the devices you need to support. So to wrap up, I wanted to revisit the hard problems that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, scoping styles is easily solved with Shadow DOM. Uh, specificity conflicts will still exist, but they will exist on a much smaller scale. They'll exist within the component itself. And that's much easier to reason about, because most components are only going to have a handful of styles. And if you're writing kind of small components that do one thing and one thing well, it's, it shouldn't be as big of a deal to deal with specificity. And so that shouldn't be a problem. And the same thing goes with non-deterministic matching. Since, since everything that applies to the component is, is written inside of the component definition, it's much easier to reason about. It's much easier to look at the source and figure out exactly what's going to happen. Whereas with CSS today, nobody can look at a full style sheet with hundreds of rules or thousands of rules and figure out exactly what's going on. It's just too much. Uh, dependency management is also easily solved with web components because components declare their own dependencies. And all that can get resolved in some kind, of, some kind of a build step. Or if you're not using a build step and you're using uh, just the browser imports, the browser automatically handles that dependency management. And the same thing with removing dead code. I mean, it, it, isn't, it isn't just solved automatically. But again, because all this stuff is on a smaller scale and it's modular, it becomes much easier to spot where the dead code is. Essentially, if you're not using the component, you won't get those styles. And so that, that problem just kind of goes away. So what I really want you to take away from this all, when, when you start thinking about how you can use web components in your applications to write more scalable CSS, um, definitely Shadow DOM is the key here. Because you want to be writing styles, CSS rules, CSS selectors that only affect the elements that you want them to affect. And, and then you can have a large team all working on individual components. And there's not this fear that one team's changes are going to affect somebody else's changes. Uh, it, makes, it makes it significantly less painful and risky to do redesigns. As I said before, every company I've ever worked at, CSS has been kind of a showstopper in terms of some feature that they wanted to implement. And that should really never be the problem. CSS should only be a showstopper in, in terms of like designing things. It shouldn't, it shouldn't affect other non-design related concerns. And, and I think one of the things that I'm most excited about for, for the future of, of writing modular CSS is this concept of taking elements and taking markup that is only presentational and abstracting the way into the shadow DOM. And, and then having your main DOM be very easy to just view source and kind of see exactly what you're working with and see all the, the real content on your page and not the presentational content. So uh, that's pretty much it. I think we're going to take a break now. Um, and then we're going to have some time for questions, Q&A later. Um, but the slides for this show, or this show, the slides for this talk are up on GitHub at uh, Philip Walton, uh, github.com slash Philip Walton slash talks. Um, and then I'm actually, I've given this talk or a similar talk twice now. And inevitably, I'm going to write a blog post about it once I kind of find some time to do that. Um, and so if you're interested in that, you can look on my website sometime soon. It'll be up there. So you can subscribe to the RSS feed or whatever. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anything else needs to be said. But go get some refreshments, and we'll come back for some Q&A.